Philadelphia International Medicine, PIM, provides international patients and physicians with access to an unmatched network of world-renowned doctors, surgeons, and hospitals that deliver personalized medical, surgical, and rehabilitative care ranked among the best in the world. Since 1999, Philadelphia International Medicine has helped patients and physicians from around the globe eliminate the guesswork, planning, and anxiety of finding and connecting with doctors and hospitals ranked among the best in the world. With eight hospitals, two medical schools, two cancer centers, and hundreds of top doctors, only PIM can bring you into its medical family with one easy phone call or email. Thanks for joining our presentation. Philadelphia International Medicine's Global Education Media Program is a monthly digital platform that invites physicians from around the world to exchange knowledge and innovative uses of medical technology, review the latest advancements in research and clinical care, and share best practices in case reviews. To contact our presenter, refer a patient, or more information, email physicians at philadelphiamedicine.com. Follow PIM's YouTube channel for more educational videos. Good morning, and uh, thank you for everybody joining us today. Um, uh, I wanted to talk today a little bit about something that we do here at the center, uh, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, also known as HIPEC. Um, this has been something that's been in going on for quite some time now, and, and it's not until you know, recent years that there's been a little bit more of a push to do these for different types of cancers uh, with a little bit more wide breadth of uh, uh, of different types of cancers. So we can start by kind of just seeing how this has been popularized and articles in CNN, the New York Times, Huffington Post, CBS News, Washington Post, the Philadelphia Magazine have all chronicled uh, various stories with patients uh, undergoing surgery uh, with uh, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy and cytoreduction. reduction. This um, is a heavily marketed modality of therapy and it's typically recommended for those with advanced abdominal cancers. And we'll get into that in more detail uh, further into the talk. You know, this is an appealing, it's, it's very appealing for a patient to hear about, you know, this kind of a strategy because all the therapy is given up front in many cases. You know, you have surgery, chemotherapy, all in one shot, and then, uh, then the recovery. So it's a, it's a very appealing thing um, in, in many cases uh, for patients to hear. So this is a, a Washington Post article outlining or chronicling uh, Dr. Paul Sugarbaker, and he's the surgeon that really kind of spearheaded this effort with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Um, and, you know, this goes on to show a story about, um, you know, a young woman who, who had surgery, um, again, for a specific, uh, specific disease type um, and had a good outcome. And the ultimate... Um, um, situation with these kinds of stories is that it does sensationalize uh, this operation and it really puts it into the mainstream. This is another article from CNN and this is interesting. This was a, a young woman with a rare treatment for a rare cancer. It was, the, it was a headlined article and she actually had a multi-cystic peritoneal mesothelioma. Uh, 130 cases report, were reported uh, worldwide back then at that point. Um, and this type of surgery, again, required very specialized um, um, uh, care. And the physician in her network, where she was uh, in Florida, uh, couldn't do it and couldn't offer it. And she ended up um, coming out to uh, Paul Sugarbaker and had surgery. But there was a whole appeals process. You know, because she wasn't in network, she couldn't get surgery down in Florida. Um, Initially, her appeals were denied, but eventually um, she was able to get the surgery that she needed, um, and she did well. Another article, and you can see again, hot chemo bath gets a fresh look in cancer fight. So again, a very sensationalized approach to how this is being presented in the media. Uh, but this is another story that chronicles a young man um, with an appendiceal cancer who underwent surgery and uh, again, did very well. Uh, again, another article, now New York Times, hot chemotherapy bath, patients see hope, critics hold doubts. Um, this is, a, again, a very controversial topic, uh, especially right now, uh, where there's always two sides to the story. Some people say that 
you know, this has been tried in the past and had limited benefit, while others are, are strong believers that there is actually benefit, um, you know, in this type of, uh, you know, in this type of a, um, a treatment algorithm. So now that we've kind of gone through a little bit of the initial parts of what this operation, what HIPEC has been, at least in the media, I want to talk about a little bit where it came from. So the ideas and concepts of the administration of intraperitoneal chemotherapy was actually founded in ovarian cancer. In 1978, the NCI published this landmark research on pharmacokinetics of intraperitoneal chemotherapy, um, which prompted a near three decade long series of studies using this concept. Uh, since 1986, there have been eight clinical trials in support, and three of these were randomized controlled phase three trials. Again, this is in the um, you know, ovarian or gynecologic literature. This is a trial published in 1996 in the New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, the bottom line is a very simple trial. Um, intraperitoneal cisplatin plus IV cyclophosphamide versus IV uh, chemotherapy alone. And the key note here is that complete debulking was done with no tumor greater than two centimeters. And why this is important, you'll see kind of a recurring theme throughout my talk. And what you see here is median survival um, for those in the intraperitoneal group was 49 months versus the IV group, which is 41 months. So right here we see, and at least in this study with ovarian cancer, that there's been a benefit with intraperitoneal chemotherapy versus IV chemotherapy. Now remember, this is a dated study. This is back in 1996. However, even at that time, it did show there was some benefit. Um, and then you look at the median overall survival, and this is a key, to a key point here. If you can debulk the tumor as much as possible. So you have microscopic versus less than a half a centimeter between, or between 0.5 and 2 centimeters. So common sense dictates the more you can remove, the better off the patients are going to do. And theoretically, the better, uh, the less advanced their tumors are. So in this study, you can see those that underwent complete reduction with just microscopic disease had a 76-month median survival. So what's the rationale? I mean, ovarian cancer is, is one disease that's divine to the perineal cavity, and that is a very important kind of concept. Um, ovarian epithelial cells seed the cavity by the way of perineal fluid, and the, the rationale of the heated chemo is that it directly contacts the drug and the tumor. So when do we use HIPEC? Now, the indications for HIPEC have really increased in the matter of even the past couple of years. Appendiceal cancers are, are, are one of the most, um, or the beginnings of where this kind of originated from in the, in the, in the general surgery literature. Um, pseudomyxoma peritonei, or the, the, the term jelly belly. Uh, metastatic colorectal cancer has really kind of come into the mainstream now um, with a lot of uh, trials and thoughts behind using this for this type of a disease. Metastatic gastric cancer, adenocarcinomas of unknown primaries, and peritoneal mesothelioma, which we had that um, um, CNN article about that patient that, uh, that had that disease. And what do all of these have in common? These are all peritoneal surface malignancies. Um, and that, that's the rationale and the, the thought behind why the heated chemotherapy shows a benefit. This was a study pu uh, published in the Annals of Surgical Oncology in 2007, and it's a consensus statement. And what's interesting here is you can see the, the the biggest study at this point in time was the 2004 study by Virwal um, out of Amsterdam. And they, it was a phase three trial, and they showed a 22-month median survival in patients when they randomized them to surgery um, and uh, heated into perineal chemotherapy. Uh, again, but you can see here in the, in, the, in the survival column here that the numbers of survival range from 13 to almost 60 months. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the population, the treatments, um, and the studies. So how do we at least kind of work the patients up? There's a rigorous diagnostic workup that at least I employ in patients that are about to be considered for some kind of invasive uh, debulking surgery. Um, and uh, typically, a contrast-enhanced CT scan is, is, is very, very, very important. Um, MRIs, PET scans are oftentimes used Laparoscopy is also used, um, you know, to assess intra-abdominal burden of disease. Um, every center kind of has their own specific um, ways or modalities of, of uh, imaging they like to use, but all these are employed in um, choosing patients. And a key concept here is patient selection. 
um, you know, we have to optimally choose a patient that we think will benefit or we know will benefit from this type of aggressive operation. Um, you know, in the consensus statement, it was interesting. They, they commented that 100% of voters considered that contrast-enhanced multi-slice CT is a fundamental imaging modality, whereas the other uh, modalities like MRI, PET, and laparoscopy um, were, were useful but not fundamental. And again, this is very institution-driven. I agree with the CT scans, but I myself will also employ the use of laparoscopy to get a better idea of essentially the lay of the land and the abdomen before I proceed with an invasive high pec. Um, the other key concept is the completeness of cytoreduction assessment. Now, what this means is you, this is the peritoneal cancer index, and the body is divided up into these various quadrants, and each of these quadrants has a score. And PCI scores, the higher the PCI score, the, the more aggressive uh, the tumor is, and the less chance, in my opinion also, is that the chances of a complete cytoreduction is possible. Typically, I use the PCI score of about 20. Those patients that are under 20 of a PCI score, I feel have more favorable disease and a better uh, chance for optimal cider reduction. Those that are over 20 um, have a little bit more of a difficult time to get an optimal cider reduction. And the key is the optimal cider reduction. So on my cases, I, I use this and I print this out for every single high pet case that I do. And I actually calculate the PCI score after the operation so I know kind of what I'm thinking about and what I'm looking at. The completeness of cider reduction score is probably one of the most important things about HIPEC. A CCR score of zero is essentially no disease. That is a complete cider reduction. A CCI or CCR score of one is where you have nodules between less than two and a half, uh, 0.25 centimeters. And then a CCI two and three are considered nodules over that. Typically, if I cannot cytoreduce a patient to at least a CCR score of one, preferably zero, I would not proceed with the heated chemotherapy because in that situation, the benefits of the heated chemotherapy um, uh, outweigh, um, the, or the risk outweigh the benefits. Um, but that's a key concept. So if a surgeon can't cytoreduce a patient to this score, then the role for, for putting somebody through the invasiveness of a heated interperitoneal chemotherapy um, is, um, is, is not uh, helpful. So this is a study uh, looking at um, published in Annals of Surgical Oncology, um, looking at moderately and poorly differentiated adenocarcinomas of the appendix. Now, this is a very hot topic also, is when you're dealing with adenocarcinomas and appendiceal cancers, the spectrum of disease for appendiceal cancers goes from low grade to you know, this moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma to a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. I treat the adenocarcinoma appendiceal cancer as kind of in a different light. Um, features such as the signet ring cells, which you see here, are very important um, in kind of determining the next steps for patients. Um, diagnostic laparoscopy in this study identified radiologically occult peritoneal disease in 42% of the patients. So this is where I feel as though you know, you have the diagnosis and the CT scan may not show a tremendous amount of disease, but what do you do with somebody that's got an adenocarcinoma with signet ring cells? So the laparoscopy sometimes gives you, again, a better lay of the land to kind of tell you what's going on. Um, um, so that, that's, a, that's a, key, a, key, uh, a key component here. And if you look over here, uh, this is the PCI score. So we just talked about this. So what you can see here, and this is kind of where I get my, um, you know, my practice from is looking at these things is in this study, the PCI score less than 20 um, overall survival was superior to those that were PCI um, greater than 20. Now, again, less PCI score, the less disease, the less disease, the, the optimal side reduction that's achievable. Uh, and it kind of all kind of is this goes hand in hand. Um, and what you can see here is this reiterates the importance of good tumor biology. Um, if you had progression of disease, you were not not going to do well with survival. Although those that responded to therapy and or had stable disease did well, did better. This is a single, this is a 12 year, uh, published 2009, 12 year single institutional experience with patients with pseudomyxoma treated with cytoreduction and HIPEC. 
although things are changing, a lot of these studies, again, are retrospective single institutional studies. So we take this data with a grain of salt. But the five and 10 year overall survival for these subset of patients was 94 and 85% uh, respectively. And the five and 10 year disease free survival was, set, was 80 and 70% respectively. And again, what you see here is they calculated a 16 PCI score. So those with the higher PCI score um, um, did, uh, more, did poorly as opposed to those with a lower PCI score. Uh, and again, this looks at um, the actual variant of the appendiceal cancer and histology. And what you can see, again, on the slide on the left is the more complete cytoreduction reduction that's done, the better uh, survival. And again, the DPAM is the classification for patients with a more well-behaved um, appendiceal um, uh, tumor. Um, and those patients did far better than those with poor histology. So again, grading histology is an extremely important um, part of the algorithm for working up a patient for heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. This is a study published in 2012. Uh, this was at this time the ninth international congress of the peritoneal surface malignancy that was held in Amsterdam. Um, at that point, they discussed, you know, this was a, a multi institutional study with almost 2,300 patients who underwent cytoreductive surgery. These were from 16 specialized units that were all affiliated with this international uh, peritoneal surface oncology group. And what they found was 42% of the patients in their, in their, in their cohort uh, had no prior chemotherapy. Again, the majority of patients had DPAM, which is the good histologic subtype. So this again shows you that patient selection is a very important factor. The, the type of chemotherapy used, there's been a lot of debates on this. There's really been shown no difference in the type of chemotherapy used. Uh, again, the majority of patients use, and I use at my institution, mitomycin C. Again, you can see here, the majority of the patients had a complete cytoreduction um, obtained. And again, Overall survival, progression-free survival, um, you can see the trends here. 36 months, median follow-up was 36 months. The median survival in their cohort of patients was 16 years. Um, so, you know, again, in a, in a properly selected patients with pseudomyxoma, you can see that from a appendiceal origin, there's good, uh, good benefit. And again, you can see here, uh, whether they got prior chemotherapy or not, there was no um, um, significance. Uh, the DPAM, again, the, the better histology, um, this just kind of summarizes what I talked about previously. Uh, and you can kind of see again the depictions of the pictures. Now we see this the same slide essentially time and time again with various studies. A CCR score of zero, patients do better. CCR score of one, patients do better. Two or three, survival um, plummets. Because again, those patients are not granted have more aggressive disease, uh, more burdensome disease, but also would not benefit from heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And again, another picture just de depicting the, the um, lower grade disease doing better. And a lot of this is also common sense. Of course, the, the, the disease that's more indolent and has a better histology is going to do better. This was a, a big trial, and I'm gonna spend a minute on this. This was published in 2003. This was a, you know, a randomized trial that looked at cytoreduction and heat intraperitoneal chemo versus systemic chemotherapy alone in those patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis from colorectal cancer. Very simple design. 105 patients randomized to standard chemotherapy um, uh, or cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC followed by chemotherapy. The key here is that the chemotherapy regimen was 5-FU and leucovorin. Uh, this predated the oxaliplatinin era, um, and the primary endpoint was survival and randomized 51, 54 patients. I mean, a very, very simple randomization. And they, this is the technique that they used for the heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And we'll go about the techniques in a, in a, in a little bit more down um, further into the talk. Um, and what they found uh, was that there were more appendiceal cancers in the standard arm. And again, these patients historically did better. So they did include patients with appendiceal cancer. Their complication rates, most common was a grade three leukopenia or a grade four GI fistula. Um, and the median survival in the standard arm was 12 months versus 22 months in the high pec arm. So this really kind of shook things up a little bit. We have a study here saying that high pec 
patients did better than those with systemic chemotherapy. But I, again, I take this um, with a grain of salt as um, these patients um, got just five a few leucovorin. So the chemotherapy nowadays is superior to what they were giving, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and what you see in their study also, when they looked at it, is the better cytoreduction reduction that's achieved, the better uh, survival uh, patients had. And again, this is kind of the regions, the PCI, the carcinomatosis score index. And you can see here again, less um, involvement of disease, the better people will do. So limited perineal carcinomatosis will do better than those with advanced um, carcinomatosis. And you can see here when they compared, um, the bottom line here was that cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC was found to be safe um, if an optimal reduction could be achieved and there was a limited PCI score. Uh, in this study, they used mitomycin C. Um, uh, but again, the big issue is now with different chemotherapies like Fulfox and Fulfury, it's hard to kind of compare this study and, and hold it against the other uh, therapies that we now have. Um, this was another study looking at cytoreductive surgery. Again, my focus right now is going to be for peritoneal carcinomatosis for colon cancer. Retrospective, 46 patients treated with peritoneal uh, carcinomatosis. Um, 34 were then treated with complete cytoreductive surgery immediately followed by HIPEC. Mitomycin C, cisplatin were used. Median follow-up was um, 14 and a half months. The, in this study, disease over 3 millimeters is actually not cytoreduced, so a little bit different. And the mean PCI score in this study was 13 and a half. What you see here is two-year overall survival, um, 31 and 10% uh, respectively. Um, and then when they looked at the grade of the cancer, obviously the less grade, the higher grade cancers uh, did more did poorly. Median survival was 20 months versus 10 months for patients with higher grade disease. Again, the key concept is going to be optimal cytoreduction reduction and favorable disease. This was a retrospective study in um, 2004 um, of, a, of a prospectively collected database from Wake Forest. And what you can see here is there was no difference in patients um, with survival in terms of surgery, prior chemotherapy, or radiation. I think it's a, an interesting point. And again, the more optimal side of reduction that's achieved, uh, the better survival. Um, other things that is interesting to look at is the uh, malignant ascites. Um, those without malignant ascites did better than those with, which also makes sense. And also liver metastases. This is also a very controversial area is do we do high chemotherapy in those with liver disease? And at least in this study, patients without liver disease uh, did better than those with liver disease. And again, resection status. I'm going to keep harping on this because it's such an important point. Um, the, the more complete side of reduction, the better survival. This was a study published in 2004, another multi-institutional study, a retro, again, a retrospective study, uh, 506 patients, again, from 28 institutions, and the endpoint was survival. And what you see here is, again, the complete insight of reduction is a very important um, um, factor, as is carcinomatosis, lymph node involvement, and tumor differentiation. And with median follow-up for this study was 53 months. Um, one and one, one year, five-year survival was estimated at 19% um, uh, in this study. And again, the CCR score, this is literally the exact same depiction across multiple studies. CCR score of zero, one, and then two. If you cannot get a complete side of reduction, the role for this operation is limited. And again, limited carcinomatosis versus extended carcinomatosis. You can see the, see the graphs here. Now, combined morbidity and mortality for these operations. Uh, I mean, I quote my patients a morbidity from a simple wound infection to something more advanced, 40 to 50%. Um, mortality here published is about 4%. This is a, a morbid operation. We're essentially putting somebody through a major operation then bathing their, 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 their bowels with heated chemotherapy. So, you know, there are, you know, risks with surgery. Fistulas here, hematologic toxicity, sepsis, bleeding, abscesses, wound infections, bowel obstructions, all these things need to be considered prior to doing, some, doing this um, procedure. 
This was a study published in 2010. Again, a retrospective cohort, multi-center study from French-speaking countries, 500 patients, 23 centers, endpoint was survival. Um, again, this is primary colorectal carcinomatosis patients. And the majority of their patients here had right colon cancers. Um, and you can see here, um, primary chemotherapy was, preoperative chemotherapy was administered in the majority of the patients, and the majority of the patients had um, positive lymph nodes. The peritoneal carcinomatosis score was, was varied, um, but the majority, again, had low carcinomatosis, and the, the least amount of patients had scores over 19, where I use 20 as the, as the marker. And again, 85% of patients received a CCR score of uh, um, a zero and 10% of a one. So they had good um, um, cytoreductive uh, scores um, with surgery. And if you can tell that the majority of the patients had PCI scores under 19, therefore a complete cytoreduction was able to be achieved. The intraperitoneal chemotherapy regimen in this study was majority was mitomycin-based um, therapy. And again, disease-free survival, overall survival. After 45 months of follow-up, overall one, three, and five-year survival was 81, 41, and 27%. And the median survival in this cohort of patients was 30.1 months. So if you think back to the Wall study in 2003, where it was 22 months, we, we, we see increase in survival um, you know, in this subset of patients. And again, this just kind of shows you that the preoperative chemotherapy had no statistical significance. The PCI score did. Um, um, the completeness of the reduction score did. And whether they had positive nodes, et cetera, did have um, um, some effect on survival. Another, uh, this is the same study, again, just kind of depicting what I just, uh, what I just said. And this is just a graphical interpretation. Again, this slide comes up time and time again. And this is a nice kind of a depiction of the PCI score where you can see the, 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 the less advanced score, um, the better patients will do in terms of survival. Now, the high pec technique. This is a very simplistic diagram where you see inflow catheters, outflow catheters. Um, I routinely place the inflow catheters in the pericolic gutters and the outflow catheters um, below the diaphragms. Um, and this is a depiction, hopefully it comes across the screen well. Um, after temperature probes are placed, this is what's known as the open coliseum technique, um, where essentially you have a retractor and you essentially sew the skin up to the retractor and it's a, almost like a bath. Um, and there are other various different types of techniques for administering the heated chemotherapy, but this is um, certainly one that is, um, is used. And this is another picture of what it looks like. Essentially, you're opening up the entire abdominal cavity. See the rim of fascia over there. And then the, um, the cavity is just bathed and uh, doused in, in chemotherapy with these inflow and outflow catheters circulating the fluid within the abdominal cavity. This is the closed technique. This is um, um, you know, where they have inflow and outflow catheters. Um, now, this is an old picture, but uh, the catheters are a lot different. Um, and essentially the abdomen is closed, uh, fluid is, is um, um, circulated within the abdominal cavity uh, in this technique. I, I like this technique, this is what I use um, because I feel like it's, um, uh, there's no spillage and it's a much more controlled, uh, a controlled technique. And this is typically done with an entire team. This is not just a surgeon doing this, it's an anesthesiologist from the head of the bed, the surgeon, the assistant, a perfusionist team comes in um, with the perfusion machine. So it's very important that it, this is a team approach when considering these types of operations. Um, and similar to cardiac, again, this is the perfusion machine and the flow rates um, range anywhere from one to two liters per minute. And the, we, routinely we keep the heated, um, heated chemotherapy at about 42 degrees centigrade. Um, and, you know, this is just a picture of what pseudomyxoma looks like. This is the typical, you know, jelly belly, um, type disease that, you know, we oftentimes um, um, see taking the omentum. Now, a true low-grade disease like this versus adenocarcinoma with signet ring cells is a big difference. In low-grade disease, you know, patients will typically do better. But if this was a, a patient with signet ring cells and a high-grade adenocarcinoma component to it, I think this operation we, we have to take with a grain of salt. 
I want to spend the, the next 10 minutes or so kind of going over a couple of um, my patients and who I operated on and kind of their scenarios. So you can kind of see what my thought process was in, in selecting patients. So this was a 50 year old, 51 year old man who presented to the emergency department with a bowel obstruction. And you can see here on the CT scan, he's got some ascites over the right liver and some haziness in the mesentery. This is a very common presentation that I end up seeing is some ascites, some stranding. They say he's got carcinomatosis. We don't know necessarily know where it's from as of yet. He was taken to the operating room at an outside hospital and was found to have a moderate amount of clear acidic fluid, um, multiple small white nodules along the peritoneum, small bowel and mesentery and cirrhosal surfaces of the bowel, but they were tiny, uh, at least by report. The pathology demonstrated a metastatic adenocarcinoma of an unknown primary. So we have a situation here where we have an adenocarcinoma patient, metastatic disease, do not know the primary source. Tumor markers were all normal. I routinely send tumor markers for all these patients, CEA, CA199s. I think it's helpful for one for one and only one thing only is really if it's elevated, it's a good number for us to use to kind of gauge the disease and see how the disease is behaving. If or not, we give them preoperative therapy. Upper and lower endoscopies were also normal in this patient. Um, sorry. So um, his pathology uh, was reviewed here, and it was actually consistent with an adenocarcinoma, again, of an unknown primary, but favoring a GI origin. He did report an appendectomy many years ago. So he went on to complete 12 cycles of Fofox. Restaging studies showed no progression of disease and stable disease. I then took him for a diagnostic laparoscopy, and this is kind of part of my algorithm. And what I saw was kind of this scarring um, along the abdomen. Uh, you can see here he's got kind of matted loops of bowel, um, scarring of the peritoneum, these white kind of plaques along the bowel itself. Um, he had pockets of mucin and ascites um, in the right lower quadrant, um, but again, very nonspecific findings. Um, and here's another view. Again, you can see just this kind of like weird plaque-like scarring uh, on the bowel and on the peritoneum, but the thick rind around the peritoneum was what was concerning along with the kind of mucinous fluid that you can see kind of collecting in the gutters over here. Just another, another picture of that. And um, you can see this is where I took some peritoneal biopsies alongside the peritoneum. There's a very thick rind around the peritoneum. So I proceeded with the next oratory laparotomy, uh, cytoreductive surgery. I performed a nomentectomy, abdominal diaphragmatic peritonectomy, and then um, um, the administration of the heated peritoneal chemotherapy. His pathology was interesting. It showed the majority of this was fibrosis. So essentially my hope was that the chemotherapy did do something and it killed uh, a lot of the active tumor cells, but there was residual metastatic disease present. Um, he undergoes surveillance scans every three months without any further chemotherapy after. He's now about three years out from surgery and there's no signs of recurrent disease. Um, again, highly selected patient. An adenocarcinoma patient with an unknown primary I gave him chemotherapy, stable disease. I tested his tumor biology. The concept of tumor biology in this situation is so important. If we can determine which patients have good tumor biology, those are the patients that I feel will benefit from an operation uh, as such. Scenario two, 53-year-old man comes to the emergency room with right lower quadrant pain. You can see here on the CAT scan, he's got this infl inflammatory mass, an abscess, presumably an abscess in the right lower quadrant. So what happens? He was told at the outside hospital, this is a perforated appendicitis. And I agree. I think this situation, this picture looks very concerning. He had an IR drainage procedure done. Um, if you look back at the, at the slide, sorry, you can see there's a little bit of a mental caking. It's very, very subtle finding. Um, and again, hindsight is 2020. But at, in the end, he ended up undergoing an FNA biopsy of this small mental cake. And lo and behold, it was a mucinous adenocarcinoma with signet ring cells. So his CEA level was 393 at the time of um, diagnosis. So again, I like to use diagnostic laparoscopy to kind of get a lay of the land and see what, what I'm dealing with. And I'll show you what I found. He um, had extensive disease, uh, carcinomatosis of the omentum, um, nodules along the peritoneum, very large omental cake. Um, and again, um, 
That's a sigmoid colon. The cirrhosis of the colon looked relatively spared, but again, he had just nodules everywhere. Um, again, another depiction of this is mostly in the right lower quadrant where everything was stuck. Remember, he did have a perforated appendicitis or appendix uh, tumor, had a drain place there. So everything was really, really, really stuck. Now, the one thing that I find limiting about a laparoscopy is it only gives us a limited view. Um, I can't feel, touch, pull, um, and, and actually, you know, explore as well as I would like, but it does allow me to see the cirrhosal surfaces of the bowel, the mesentery, et cetera. Um, so in this, in this thing, in, in this scenario here, um, I gave him a peritoneal carcinoma score of 18, maybe generous, it may have been a little bit more. Um, we had consulted medical oncology, uh, and given um, he was started on a Folfox and a Vastin, um, because again, this was not a typical low-grade process. He had a moderate amount of disease, an adenocarcinoma component with signet ring cells. He got chemotherapy, he responded, his CA went down to 23. Um, I ended up, um, he ended up progressing, unfortunately. Uh, I usually give a six to eight week kind of a chemotherapy holiday in these patients because um, I want to gauge their disease and see how it responds. Um, he unfortunately progressed on that, went on to get um, additional chemotherapy, um, and then fortunately progressed on that and never made it to surgery. Now, um, these are the types of patients that are tough because his disease obviously progressed while off chemotherapy. And, and in, my, in, my, in my practice, if that happens, and I don't think there's necessarily a role for putting somebody through a cytoreduction and a heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy operation, um, it's got to have disease stability. We're trying to test his tumor biology. So we found that his tumor biology, you know, at this point was one that was aggressive. And um, unfortunately, there was not much um, we could offer in terms of a, a surgical uh, cure for this man. So where are we going with, with this stuff? Now, there's some up and coming trials. This is one Cairo 6 randomized control trial, very interesting design. Um, perioperative keep systemic therapy and cytoreductive surgery with HIPEC, experimental arm. This is kind of what, I, what I've kind of been doing in terms of um, patients with adenocarcinoma type, type disease versus upfront cytoreductive surgery at HIPEC alone, which is a control arm. The algorithm is 3 KPOX or 4 Folfox, new adjuvant doublet therapy with the bevacizumab, um, followed by a restaging. If you are to progress, patients still undergo laparotomy, followed by cytoreductive surgery if possible. If you don't, or there's stable disease or responding disease, you get additional chemotherapy, then followed by laparotomy and cytoreductive surgery. It's interesting, in 2016, the expected number of patients being referred for, uh, for, for this type, colorectal peritoneal adenocarcinoma in the Netherlands was 420. With an expected accrual of 20%, this study should be completed in the next four years. So something to be looking forward to for the future. Another trial, which I find very interesting, is the role of adjuvant HIPEC in patients with high-risk with high colon cancer. So the aim here is to, is to kind of decide if adjuvant HIPEC before routine adjuvant systemic chemotherapy for cure, after following a curative resection for T4 or perforated disease is beneficial. <laughs> this, is, this is interesting. So based on the current literature, about 25% of colon cancer patients with T4 or perforated tumors will develop peritoneal carcinomatosis. In this study, the adjuvant HIPEC is suspected to result in a 60% relative risk reduction of that. So essentially, you have patients that perforate high-risk disease. They get optimally reduced or, or, or um, surgery, and they get systemic chemotherapy. Um, the, 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 the fix here is that we would be giving patients heated chemotherapy before that to potentially treat any microscopic um, cells that may have been missed or spilled out during the perforation or um, you know, at that time. Um, So this is just a, the, the Ninth International Congress, this, this far past 2014, but what I wanted to kind of show here is that this International Congress on Peritoneal Surface Malignancies is held biannually. First meeting was held in London in 1998, starting with 14 people. Uh, in the years, it's grown to more, more than 500 participants. So the idea of peritoneal surface malignancies has been one that has grown over the years. 
Um, we are exploring. This is an, this is just a program of this um, meeting, and what you can see here is the indications. I mean, this first thing here is you know report of nine one thousand nine hundred and ten patients. Um, video for minimal access cytoreductive surgery for pseudomyxoma, um, abdominal mesothelioma. I don't know if you can see these yet or see these well. Ovarian cancer. You see it for gastric cancer. Uh, you see it for small cell round tumors, sarcomas. Um, it really just kind of shows us that we are branching out with using this modality of therapy for different cancers, but we have to be careful because, and, and trials and randomized trials are the only way we're going to be able to see if this type of modality is going to show a benefit with different types of cancers. We know it works with low rate appendiceal cancers. We're trying to figure out if it works with uh, metastatic colorectal cancers. There's a lot of other cancers where theoretically it seems to be beneficial, but we have to prove that with randomized controlled trials. The next meeting in 2018, Paris, France, um, where I'm sure there's going to be, again, much more uh, debate um, and much more data being presented. Um, I conclude by saying that management of peritoneal-based malignancies have changed significantly in the past 20 years. Um, it, it's a, it seems as though there's a cheering section where high pec will wax and wane over the years. My father is a surgeon and earlier on in his practice, intraperitoneal chemotherapy was being done with IP chemo ports and all these things fell out of favor and now I'm doing it and you know, he's still, you know, we, we still have some arguments back and forth about the benefits of doing this, but I think there's gonna be a lot of new data coming out in the next couple of years these trials that are recruiting in the Netherlands are going to be very, very important to help kind of guide us in terms of what we're going to do. Um, part of the ECOG, and you know, there's a lot of studies going on and a lot of talks and discussions about implementing heated interperitoneal chemotherapy, working on trials here as well. Um, but this is an exciting time for, for patients um, and for us as clinicians. And I think the one take home message I can tell you is patient selection is extremely important, good tumor biology. Um, and you really have to select these patients carefully that will benefit from this operation. Thank you.